Hey everybody, welcome to Bones Collector. This is a video series where Lori and I are taking the time to play through our library two or three games at a time and then making a video. We want to do that so that we can show you the games all set up so you can get an idea about what is in the box and then I can tell you how to play the game in a little more detail. We're, we hope you enjoy this series and I'm always telling you that we play our library and that's what I wanted to show you and why I wanted to make these, this video series. So I hope you enjoy it. Hey everybody, so this is Mercator. And Mercator is a game designed by Uwe Rosenberg. came out in 2010 for one to four players, 45 to 90 minutes, and is a pick up and deliver contract fulfillment set collection game. And the person with the most victory points is the winner. And I wanted to tell you about this game. We just got done playing it and I reset a few things that I'm going to talk about, but basically this is what you look like when you're going to get done playing the game. Some of the things I really love about this game are the eight page rule book. This is a very small rule set. I really appreciate that and it has a small table presence because of the small main board and then you have a time track board over here you're going to deal with and then each player has a player board. And in this game, it is a pick up and deliver game. And this is about the 30 years of war in Europe in the 1600s. That's the theme here. And you have the main board that has city locations on it that you're going to use this marker to mark where you go for a location, what city you're going to, and pick up any goods that happen to be in that city. But during the 30 years war, Hamburg was the city where all the commerce was taking place. All the warring nations could go there and pick up fabric and food, weapons. So this was going on in the 1600s constantly. They would come in and do all, all trade in commerce in, in Hamburg and that's what the theme of this game is. Now physically this game is pretty cool because the main board has cutouts for every one of these bins. Each one of these bins has a different color cube in them. You can see the cutout in the board, it sits right in here. And when we put this game away, we put each bin with the cubes in it in a bag and seal it up. That way setup time is very quick for this game. You have a time track board. I reset this and it would be empty usually at the end of the game. And these are where you take time tokens from because whenever you travel it will tell you whether you gain time or lose time on this main board. So that's very important in this game because if you want to go to a location to fulfill one of these contracts and you don't have the time to go there, you obviously can't go there to fulfill that contract and that will really put the pressure on you. So you have to plan how many time tokens you have as you're moving around this board. And you can pick up time tokens in other locations. So you may have contracts you want to fulfill, you know you don't have the time tokens, so maybe like in this case you could go to Hamburg and pick up two time tokens and then later go to another location, Newfoundland or Italy, where you have to pay time to, to go there and then you can fulfill your contracts for there. But that's what you're doing. You're trying to move around this board, pick up some of these resources, fulfill these contracts, and once you fulfill the contract, you can get the next contract. In other words, if you fill a number three contract, you can take a number four. If you fill a number five contract, you can take a number six. And then once those contracts are fulfilled, you want to think about selling them because that's the only way you can get money. So you're, you're get, getting a trade network going on is what you're doing in Mercator. And this game is super exciting. It looks kind of bland and boring, but let me tell you, it is not. It is one of Uwe Rosenberg's best game designs and it's super enjoyable because of the tightness of this design. The, the game comes with a player aid that tells you how the game is scored once the game is over with. You also start out with this little supply board and you have one of every color cube on the supply board and I, I would advise you to use those as quickly as you possibly can. That way at the end of the game you have none left, which I did. I had a couple left and that makes you feel bad because you could have used them at some point during the game. And then each one of these color cubes has a value of two different things. It, for instance, the red cube is a citrus fruit and it is a spice, but every one of these cubes has two values, so when you're fulfilling these contracts, you have to take a look at what this contract needs and go around the board and pick those up. And it's not as easy as it sounds because I guarantee you, you're going to want to fulfill a contract and you're going to be one cube short on something. It's just the way this game is because you're just not going to have what you need, but as hard as you try to do that, it's very difficult, and that's what makes it so much fun. On your player board, it has an order of things to do on your turn, and that makes this game a lot easier to play also. It has a 
Number one, you're going to sell any of these contracts you want to sell. You're going to buy any buildings that you want to buy. Some bonus cards that you can buy or building cards and building cards give you points at the end of the game for various things. Step number two is travel on the board, time management. That means you're taking or leaving time. Now, sometimes you don't have to do either. And then take goods and refill. So once you take the goods from a space, you have to refill any that are connected by these ropes on the board. So you would put one cube on each one of those in most cases. Then step number three, fulfill any contracts that you have on your board. You can also trade four cubes of one color for a certain cube that you might need. So you can do a four to one trade and get new contracts if you're fulfilling some. And step number four is pretty cool because it's called a company and the person that accompanies can fulfill contracts and get goods. So when you accompany somebody, if your opponent goes to a location, you have the opportunity on the board to accompany them and you pay a time token to go there. Maybe you have a contract you can fulfill. That's the best way. So if you're going to accompany somebody there, maybe there's a contract, oh my gosh, you're going to Sweden? I've got a contract that I can fulfill there. I'll pay the time token, go to Sweden, accompany you there, and I'll finish that contract. But also, we acquire these bonus cards throughout the game. And they have a monetary value on them, so the money that you're getting from selling contracts, these are some of the cards you're going to buy. And you put those bonus cards over by your player board and they'll only benefit you. So this card, for instance, says if I go to Denmark, I get plus two grain. So I get two yellow cubes if I go to Denmark. That's me. If I accompany someone to Denmark, I only get one. But still, maybe that's something you need very badly. So if your opponent goes to Denmark and you need that one cube, then you might want to pay the time token. Maybe you have them stacked up over here. You pay the time token and you can accompany them and get goods. So that's pretty cool too. But anyways, there's three decks of cards you're going to deal with. You have the contracts themselves, the bonus cards that you're going to acquire uh, during the game, and then the building cards are going to give you points at the end of the game. Then you get a whole deck of these cards and they're very important. However, you're only going to get maybe two or three of these by the end of the game. So it's not like an embarrassment of riches where you're going to buy 10 building cards. You can't get away with that. Money is tight in this game because there's a limit. You can only have $15 at the end of your turn. Otherwise, you lose it. And you can only have five contracts. And then at the beginning of your next turn, you have to sell down to five before you can begin your turn. So there are restrictions in the game that make it very tight to play. And that's what makes it so wonderful. I really, really enjoy this game. And that's really basically it. You're going to pick a location, go to that location, pick up the goods, put them on your player board. Again, you're restricted on how you do that. When you get more than one cube from a location, you have to put one cube in one of that color bin, one cube in the other color of bin, and then the rest of them you can designate wherever you want out of those two bins. In other words, if you picked up, like I have all these green cubes, if I picked up all these green cubes on my turn, I'd have to put one in muskets, one in livestock, and then I can put however many I want in the muskets and livestock bins after that. So I might want to just split them and put three in muskets and three in livestock. So I put three in, three in each. So you might want to split them up like that because during the game on this time track, when you travel and you're taking tokens from this time track, when you get to the end of the row, every one of these has a letter on the back. And whenever you get the last token in that row, you read the letter on the back. This one says B. So we would look in our B storage column. We'd have to sacrifice one of the cubes out of that column. And that can be super hurtful. If you're reaching those time token tracks at the end, flipping that over, and you don't have that many cubes on your board, and boom, you lose the only grain you had, and you were going to use it to fulfill a contract. So that, that can be very hurtful. And those are the types of things in this game that, that make it so wonderful. This is probably... Man, it's up there with Oracle of Delphi when it comes to pick up and deliver for me. I really enjoy this game. It's one of the few Uwe Rosenberg games of his big box games that I've kept. I'm talking about Agricola, Caverna, La Havre, Feast for Odin, Glass Road, Fields of Arla, Gates of Lo Yang. I played all of those games numerous times and I moved all those games on and just kept this one. Now I do have a lot of Uwe Rosenberg games, but it's like Patchwork, Cottage Garden, his lighter fare, Nova Luna, and our Agricola is Agricola Big Box, All Creatures Big and Small. I love that much better than the original Agricola.
but this game for his bigger box games. I like this so much more than the rest of those. This game plays in less than an hour. That fits right into our our, our wheelhouse. That's where we like to play board games. And I think when you sit down at the gaming table and you know, oh, this is gonna, only going to take an hour and I'm excited about playing it, that is why you keep certain board games because they fit your play style. And the things to think about in this game and where the strategy comes into play is you want to daisy chain as much as you can. You have to be so efficient and pick up and deliver. It's one of my favorite mechanisms in board gaming, by the way. And I really, really enjoy it because it forces you to be efficient in your movement. Yeah, I'm going to go to this location because I need those goods to fulfill a contract even though that I can't fulfill that contract at that location because you'll have to go to the location to actually fulfill the contract so you have to think ahead then you want to look at okay I'm fulfilling a number six contract on my next turn number seven is Denmark I'm gonna take that's gonna be my next contract when I fulfill the number six I'm gonna take the top card on number seven it's Denmark and I need three different claws on my goods board in order to fulfill that contract well, guess what? I already have it. I already have the three different claws that I need. So I want to get there before my opponent gets that number seven. I want to fulfill that number six in Spain and that, so that I can take that number seven and on my next turn go to Denmark. And so you're thinking ahead like that so that you can be prepared to fulfill contracts as you go. Because the two end game triggers in this game are the first player to finish a number 10 contract and take this card, that triggers the end of the game or when the time track is completely empty, then the last time token is taken, everybody gets one more turn and the game is over. It plays so smoothly, so wonderfully. Again, the restrictions of the game are classic Rosenberg, where, in a, like in Agricola, it's a very tight set of rules, and money is tight, resources are tight, and contracts, trying to fulfill them in order is very, very difficult because again you want to not just take them willy-nilly you want to make sure you're looking at what the next contracts are that's going to fulfill it, because you want to stay ahead and and plan ahead and that's what makes a good efficient trade network that you're going to set up in Mercator it's why I love the game it's why it's incredible I'm going to tell you about it we just got done playing it and uh, it just reinforces how beautiful this game is again the only unfortunate part of course about Mercator is very difficult to find uh, a lot of people don't like this game because of the dry nature of it but the game mechanics themselves uh, overshadows any problems anybody should ever have uh, I, I would I like games that are very thematic I like games that have beautiful components this isn't going to be like that there's nothing here that's inferior in any way I mean everything that is in this box works beautifully uh, again, small rule set. I can't say enough about this game. It's in my ultimate top 100 at number 100. So obviously I love it and I've loved it ever since I've, I've gotten a hold of it. And I paid very dearly for this game because again, it wasn't easy to find and it's not going to be easy to find for you. And I apologize for that because this game is so much better than so many games that I see reviewed on YouTube. And this game is magnificent. It gets overlooked. Don't do that. If you get a chance to go to a convention and play it, please do. It's Wonderful by Uwe Rosenberg, Mercator. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. So this is Rialto, and this is a board game by Stefan Feld. came out in 2013, plays two to five players, which is kind of rare for a Feld game. They're usually only two to four. And then it plays in 45 to 60 minutes. We did it in 50 minutes both times, so an hour with setup and takedown. This is an area majority influence game, has card drafting, hand management, and some bonuses for card action majorities. And the winning condition, of course, is most victory points. So we just got done playing this game. Let me talk about the rule book. This rule book is very good. You can learn how to play the game from this rule book. It's only eight pages. It has a glossary, not only the buildings that you use in the game, but also the cards that are in the game and the actions that they do. So, I mean, that takes up a lot of the rule book. There's not a lot of rules to this game. It's a light to medium weight game. It plays very slick and very smoothly, as you would expect from Stefan Feld. He does a very good job with these board game designs. We just finished playing this, so these markers and, and the bridges and, 
and the gondolas are still on the board, but I laid out the cards so that I could show you the card mechanic and how it works. And at the beginning of your turn, and it shows you on the board exactly what you're doing, phase one, phase two, phase three. I love it when board games do that and have that on the board. It, it, you have to take away some art off the board, but that just doesn't bother me. Take away the art, show me what I'm supposed to be doing in this game so that I don't have to refer to the rule book or try to remember and maybe mess something up. So this, in this case, you can just go down this board. And in phase one, it'll tell you you can activate any green buildings that you have on your player board because you have a player board that's going to hold your money and the buildings that you're going to use and your counselors that you're going to place on the board. They'll be over here on your player board and you have a supply of them here also. So you only start out with five and as the game wears on and you take that particular action, you're going to move them from the supply into your player supply where you can move them to the board. Because again, you're trying to get area influence in this game. But the first thing you're going to do is lay cards out like this. Whoever the first player is, is going to select one of these rows of cards. Well, they have to look at them and decide which actions they want to take. There's six different cards that have six different actions, plus there's a joker card. So you kind of look at these piles of cards and decide, like this row of cards right here has two jokers, and it has two bridges, one gondola, and a counselor card, which counselor cards allow you to place from your player board into that area. So you want to make sure you do that because you can't go back. The only way you can go back and do that is by placing a gondola and then you only get to place one marker. So getting markers on areas with those counselor cards is very important because again you have this marker and you starts out on number one. It's a six round game. You go one and you lay these markers out one through six randomly on the board and you use this marker to mark which district you're in at that particular time and once the sixth round is over, the sixth dis district is over, the game ends. So you get to see this game coming to fruition very quickly. Once you select a row of cards, then the next player has to look at what's left and select a row of those cards. And you have six cards face up and two face down. You'll take that row of cards decide what seven cards you want to keep because you've got eight cards and you're going to have to discard one of them for the most part. You have some buildings here that will let you change that a little bit. But that's how it works. And you play those cards in order as it shows you in phase two here. In phase two it tells you to play your doge cards first, your money, your buildings, your bridges, your gondola, and your counselor cards. And as you're playing those, the person that plays the most of that particular card action, in other words, the first one is the doge, and that's this track right here. If everybody plays one card, except another player has two, whoever had the majority, whoever plays the most of that card, you get a bonus. So instead of, if you play the doge card, and you play two, and that's most anybody's played, you get a bonus of one. So you would move your marker three spaces, and everybody else who played one card would move it one. If you didn't have any, of course, your marker is not going to move. But every one of these actions, if you play the majority uh, action cards, you're going to get a bonus of one. A bonus of one money, a bonus of one point when you play bridge cards, and so forth. So that's very important. I mean, there's lots of interesting decisions to make in this game. It's a tiny game. Look how little this board is. And it's just, I love that though, because everything's right in front of you here. And there's very seldom will you play a game that has such interesting and deep decisions in such a small package as Rialto. And this came out in 2013. It's going to be re-implemented as New York by Queen Games. It was kickstarted. It's been over a year, I'm sure, and it hasn't been come to retail yet, but you will be able to purchase this game because I believe it's pretty hard to find this box, uh, if I'm not mistaken. This is a wonderful little box game that was, I don't know, it's probably relatively inexpensive when it came out. And you can see this Loris player board over here. And then also, when we're playing a two-player game, you can use a dummy player variant. You don't have to, but we do, because it makes the game more interesting and a lot more tight because the dummy player has his little markers and he gets seven cards and if those seven in those seven cards he has the most counselor cards like in this instance he had three four five six so he had five counselor cards to play uh, in this particular round and he got a bonus of one wow that was really hurtful for us because 
<laughs> we, he, I mean, when, when, when the W player gets that, you're just never going to catch up. Because he had the majority, he's going to own that district. So whatever points are available there, the best we can do as players is fight over, in a two-player game, is fight over second and third. And you do get half points for second and half points for third. Half points for second and half of seconds points for third. So <laughs> that's the way that works. And you have all these gondola things, these little tiles here that you can see already on the board. And they start the game up here. And those all have points on them, left and right. And you get to place those. Those and are bridges. Right. You said gondolas. There's gondolas and bridges, okay? There's gondolas and bridges. Each one of them, the gondola and the bridge, has two point totals on them on the left and right. Well, the gondola is one on both sides, but the bridges have a lot of points, like five and six, five and three, six and three, that kind of thing. And players place those by earning the majority of those actions with their cards, and then they get the opportunity to play these in these areas here where you see these white squares, and you're going to want to put them where you're going to score. I mean, if, if there's a... Uh, a tile like this is a five and three you're definitely going to want that five to point towards like this area here for me I have four markers in there nobody else had any in of influence so I would want that five and put it right there to get five points for that district and that's how that works then if you can get some counselors out on many turns in a row and in these districts you can earn these bonus tiles this bonus tile is for getting one in each of the northern districts, which there's only three, and then this bonus tile in the southern part is worth five points, and you have to have one in the four southern districts. Is it four or three? I guess it is only three. There's three in each. There's three in each? Yeah. Okay, one, two, three. One, two. So it is just three in each. So if you are the first one to get one counselor marker in those in the northern or in the southern, you get that five bonus points, and that can be huge in this game. So you have to kind of pay attention to that and think about those things. Again, there's a lot to think about in this little game. And then you have a market of buildings over here. It, one of the actions is a building card. It has bricks on it. And when you play that building card, you're allowed to take a building of that value. Now these building tiles give you special powers that are good throughout the rest of the game if you pay for them. Every building that you take off this board, and you have to take them according to the value of the, the cards, action cards that you played, you take that, put it on your player board, but every time you want to activate it in every round, you have to pay a buck. So you're going to have to acquire money constantly to pay for the buildings that you've built. And the only way you can do it, like this one, is a building with a picture of a joker on it. And that's what I was saying about mitigating some of the bad luck you may have with cards, is you can get this building with a joker on it, you put a dollar on there, and that's an extra joker. So if you've only got seven cards in your hand, you now have eight, and one of them's a joker. So that's pretty cool. I've had this game for quite a while, and gosh, we've played this game a lot, and I've enjoyed it every time. It's very, again, for a Stefan Fell game, very light, and that doesn't mean it's easy because the decisions are very interesting and very difficult to make. I guarantee you when you play this game, there's a lot of people who haven't played this game. I mean, they look at it and say, well, it doesn't look interesting. Trust me, you don't, you're not even thinking about how it looks because, again, the, the meaty decisions that you're making and the difficult decisions that come you know, every round in this game, every t turn that you take is going to erase your mind so busy thinking that you don't know what anything looks like. Yes, it could. It's wasn't produced, wasn't the best production on the planet, but what can I say? It's still a beautiful game. It's a beautiful design, and there are games coming out every day that cannot hold a candle to Rialto. There is a couple of imperfections in this game, and one of them is the scoring track, but I think that, that I read where the guy was very sorry about that, that designed that. He didn't get a chance to play this game before it went to retail and discovered after the fact that this scoring track was pretty bad. It's just difficult to, to see where the spaces are. But, I mean, once you get used to it, we were able to use it accordingly and had a good time with it. It doesn't hurt gameplay whatsoever. It's a wonderful, wonderful game, Rialto. The Real, this uh, do, those track I talked about up here is very important, and I didn't say why it's important, but that's going to be the tiebreakers. So, and, and it's very huge in this game. Because of the way the mechanic, card mechanic works in the game, a lot of times you're going to play exactly the same amount of cards as somebody else. And 
normally that would be a tie but there's a tie breaker and that's the dose track and when you are ahead on the dose track all tie breakers go to you so it's very important to pay attention to that. So there's just a lot going on and Stefan Feld did a great job of mitigating any kind of bad luck you may have in this game and you just have to know how to weave that together and that's what makes this game so doggone interesting. I'd like to tell you about it and that's it. Really that's all I can really say about it. It's a wonderful game. I hope you get a chance to play it if you haven't already and yeah that's Rialto. Hey everybody so this is Witchstone by Reiner Canizia and Martino Chia Chiera. It's a two to four player game it plays in 60 to 90 minutes. It takes us an hour to player. And it came out in 2021. And of course, it's, the first thing you want to want to know is this game good enough to have gotten in my top 10 for 2021? It surely is. It's a wonderful game. And it's a tile placement grid coverage game, network and route building in the crystal ball. So, yeah, this is a really, really fun game. We just got done playing it three times. And I've learned a lot in those three plays. Uh, I, each, each play is so different in this game, which is wonderful. I really, really like that. But before we talk about that, let me show you some other. Let's talk about the production of the game. You have some really nice cards here. They're not linen cards, but they're good enough. You don't handle these. These aren't in your hands. They don't have to be high-quality cards. But they're pretty cool. The, arts, the art on them is... Is pretty and and uh, there's two a couple of different kinds of cards in here. There's prophecy cards, which are end game goals, where you get points, and other ones are, I don't know, magic cards maybe they're called, where they give you Spells. spell cards, where they give you extra uh, plus actions on whatever action you happen to be taking. So the card stock's fine. Uh, you have wooden witches that you're going to place here in the crystal ball area, and you have one big mama witch. I call her Big Mama, I suppose she's a Big Mama witch, and then uh, all the rest of the witches are smaller, and they're all wooden, so that's pretty cool. Then you have energy tokens in your player color. They're shaped like a diamond, but they're tall, uh, kind of tall, and then you place them on the board on these spaces to create routes that you're going to be able to place your smaller witches on. And then on some of the other tracks you have an owl in your player color like on the magic wand and the scoreboard and so forth you have an owl and then you also have these crystals that are in your player color on your board there's ones in your player color and then there's everybody has a black crystal also that's a, worth double action so uh, those are on your player board and those are fine and then it has various tokens you know these are your hex tokens you're gonna place in your cauldron then you have owl tokens that are on the pentagram over here they're fine quality uh, the board isn't the thickest, but it's good enough. I don't think there's a problem with it whatsoever. The production's fine. The rule book is very good. And the insert in the game looks like this. And you can see how I, it's fine. Everything fits in this box. Now, I watched Tom Vassell, and he said that he was going to throw his insert away. And I don't know what he's thinking, but this insert is fine. It works good. you got a place for everything in there and your cauldrons sit right in there and then your boards sit on top of that and hold everything in. So I don't know what this issue was. <laughs> so yeah, that's the production of the game. It's fine because the game, the price point on this game I think was 45 bucks. Oops, I'll turn it like that. The price point on the game I think was $45. And I like to tell you guys that. I want you to know how much we're, you know, we're, we bought this game and that's how much we paid, $45. I think we got on Amazon. Maybe. Yeah. It, and it's worth 45 bucks. You know why? Because it's a terrific game. And if you can get fun and legs out of a game, by legs I mean you're going to play it over and over again for a really long time, uh, it's worth whatever. You know, just you have to try to rationalize that. It comes with some player aids, one player aid for every language. So it comes in four languages. So you get four player aids. And it has a track where you put your familiar, it's called, on here and keep track of how many actions you're going to take. And it helps to do that. You can use the cards of the other languages for the track, but of course, unless you can read, uh, you're multilingual, you can read those other ones. But uh, there's only going to be one in English. We printed some off Board Game Geek, and so we now we have four English player aids for our game. And you have these player screens that are pretty cool because they tell you give you a little bit of player uh, information here on how the game works and then it also has a picture of a character on the back and I thought it was a pretty cool detail that like this is my character I'm the yellow player this guy looks like Doctor Strange 
a little bit and mm -hmm. it, it looks like he's got a really cool cape that would attack you you know on and so that's pretty cool and he's holding a rat which is my familiar or my my buddy yeah, the rat is my animal buddy that I use to track my actions and he's holding a rat and, it, and it's a rat so that's pretty cool detail I thought and then Lori's the one she used was this gal that you know kind of a witchy wizardy looking gal and she's got a frog on her shoulder and her familiar was a frog so I like those little details when they do that kind of cool stuff but let's talk about the gameplay a little bit real quick the secret to this game is working this cauldron and on this cauldron you're going to be placing these double hex tiles now these double hex tiles have a picture of an action you're going to take on each end so in this case it'd be a scroll and an energy and you're trying to hook these together to combo things. In other words, if if I can hook, you know, and, and, geez, I wish I could hold this board up. But here I have one, two, three, four, five, six pentagrams hooked together. When I when I played this tile, it gave me six pentagram actions. So I was able to move on the pentagram wheel over here six spaces. That's huge. I mean, that's what you're trying to do is hook these things together to get as many like items hooked together as you can because you get all those actions. And it helps you to do that because it triggers other actions. This is a game where you're going to be looking to combo as much as you possibly can. Now, you have six different actions you can take on this cauldron. There's six different icons on these hex tiles. And they're all here on the board. You have the scroll action where you can get magic cards which help you during the game and prophecy cards which give, which give you points at the end of the game you have a magic wand action which is down here at the bottom of the board and you can move up that magic wand and at different points on the wand you get benefits and or actions and if you're ahead you get double so Lori was able to benefit from that when she was playing because she's ahead on I think she was ahead pretty much the whole game on the wand so she was getting double when she would hit those action spaces then over here you have the vial cabinet and it is a place where once you move crystals off of your board, which I probably should have said that first, there's the crystal action you can take. These crystals on your board, once, let's say you got three crystal actions, you can move three spaces on your board, and wherever you come out of, of your cauldron, there's arrows that show you only places where you can come off out of the cauldron. And wherever you happen to come out, in this instance, it was a witch, you have to put that in the vial cabinet in the witch row. And you have all the all six of the actions are pictured in this vial cabinet and wherever you come out in the cauldron that's where you're going to place this and you get a double action so that's pretty doggone cool and you have to plan for those things when you're working that cauldron you might tell yourself well, there's no way I can get a witch action you know because and I was I was in that very position I couldn't get a witch action but I could get a crystal action so when I hooked four crystals together I moved one of my crystals three spaces brought it out on the witch space and I was able to put the crystal up here on the vial cabinet and get two witch actions without having to connect them in, in my cauldron. So those are the types of things you have to think about. And then up at the top here you have the pentagram where you're moving around this pentagram wheel and you're acquiring magic tokens and point tokens which can be very valuable also. The, the magic tokens you can actually it has a picture of two actions on them and two different actions and you can choose to take one of those actions twice or you can take this and put it in your cauldron and that's pretty handy when you put this in the cauldron because now it gives me another place to hook up and get these actions that's pretty neat and get extra actions so that's something that you have to think about also and then obviously the idea is we're we're in this witch business to energize re-energize this crystal ball and that's what we're doing in the central part of the board here network building with our energy cubes which is one of the actions you take and moving these witches to pick up these tokens they give you an additional action plus on the back they're worth two points so that's another thing to think about yeah and that's pretty much it the only thing I want to talk about is the prophecy cards I do want to mention these prophecy cards are worth three five and seven points most of them maybe all of them and you have to complete them those sections in order in other words if you want to get the seven points you have to have completed the three point and five point objective first before you can get the seven points for completing the seven point objective 
there's only one exception and that's this card right here where it talks about putting witches in the central part of the board here the rules state that you can only put one witch in this center part of the crystal ball so each player can only put one there well obviously you can't complete all three of these if you're only putting one witch in there because it's telling you you have to put them on space two, three, two, three, and five. Well, you really can't do that, obviously, because you can only put one witch in there. And this card is completely different. You can just complete one of these. Okay, so if you if nobody's on the five space and you go there, you're going to get seven points, and then your card's done. If somebody is already on the five space and you have this card, hey, if you put your witch on the three space, you can still get five points, and that's pretty good. But this card is one that you can complete one section and don't have to do the others. I just wanted to point that out because we were really confused by it and didn't know how it played, and it really doesn't connect the dots that well in the rule book. They leave it for you to assume, since you can only place one witch there, that you don't have to treat this card like the other prophecy cards, and you know what they say about assume. So we didn't bother to assume that, but we got on a thread on Board Game Geek, I believe, and uh, we were able to ascertain that this card is different than the rest. I just wanted to point that out in case from you get this From the designer. Game. Yeah, and that's from the designer, yeah. absolutely. So that's pretty cool. And is that all I want to do to talk about this game? I love this game. It is fun. It's the type of game that really can grow board gaming as a hobby. It's not hard to grasp, not difficult to grasp. It's so approachable for experienced gamers and for novices, people who are just learning to play board games or getting into a little more complex board games. I would say this thing is, I would say this is a medium complexity board game to me. And I think it's a wonderful board game. It's excellent design. This is the type of board games, again, that I wish there were more of rather than some of these complex journeys that take you two and three hours. It's why I, I didn't really put Ark Nova in my final top ten, because it just takes too long to play. I'm not a person that's going to sit down at the gaming table at two-player count and play for two hours. We're just not going to do it. I love this. This is fast and furious. You have 15 of these double hex tiles, and you're going to use 11 of them. So you got 11 turns. And as the game goes on, it accelerates. I love that. You know, once you start placing those tiles in your cauldron and you're trying to connect them, that you're triggering more actions, and those actions are triggering other actions, and those actions are triggering... I mean, it's hard to keep track of all the things you're going to be able to do on your last turn. And your last turn is the most difficult because you're trying to squeeze out every ounce of magic out of your cauldron that you can get. I love that type of game. Again, it just accelerates to the end, and it's just the culmination of working those actions and then figuring up your victory points. It's just a wonderful experience you guys want to tell you about, and that's Witchstone. Okay, everybody, that was the games for today that we played this week, and I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope that you got something, a little more something out of them than doing just those top 10s or top 100 lists. Because again, I'm able to show you more in that regard. Please like and subscribe. When you take the time to like our videos and then make a comment, that's our payday. We don't get paid for any of this until you guys tell us what you think of our video. And thank you so much for that. Have a great day, and I'll see you the next time on The Bones Collector. And remember to keep on board gaming because it is the best doggone hobby on the planet. Bye-bye.